we were discussing the other day how in Dei Verbum, paragraph 18, talks about how the, um, the Gospels hand on to us the historical truth about Jesus, what Jesus really did and said. And um, I'm going to expound on that today because I'm going to show you how this has been denied by most biblical scholars. I'm going to show you books that I used when I was, I had to go back to college for a year in order to enter a theology school when I was already in my early 30s. Okay. Actually, I was in my late 20s. And um, anyway, because of this, this uh, issue and the problem that you may encounter someday if you ever take a, a scripture class in college, um, I want you to be armed to make a good defense of the historical truth of the gospel. And because I was in this battle for many years, I wrote a book on the topic. And this is chapter 5 from my book. I didn't bring my book in, I should have brought it in. Chapter 5, the New Testament. Okay? It's, I wrote a question and answer catechism on the document, the sacred constitution on the, on, uh, the Word of God. Okay? Dei Verbum. Sacred constitution on divine revelation, I should say. Okay? And if you look, number 73, question 73. I did 100 questions. There's 100 questions and answers. You know what's cool about doing a book like this? See, I get to formulate the questions, and I know what the answers are going to be, see? So it's a good teaching method. It's a good catechetical method. So in number 73 on the New Testament, okay, what does the council, I mean the Second Vatican Council here, mean by saying the church has always everywhere maintained, continues to maintain the apostolic origin of the Gospels? Now, we know what that means, right? The apostolic origin of the Gospels that the Gospels are written by whom? Apostolic origin means they were written at the time of the apostles, and two of them were apostles, they were eyewitnesses. Who are they? Matthew and John. Okay. Those were two of the twelve. The other two are of the apostolic age, but they relied on eyewitnesses to tell them what Jesus said. Mark, Mark maybe heard some of the things himself. We think he was a disciple of Christ. But especially Luke, Luke relied on eyewitnesses. Okay. So uh, my answer to question 73, they evert, well, that's the document we're studying on, on divine revelation, says the apostles, others of the apostolic age, handed on to us in writing the same message they had preached, the foundation of our faith, the fourfold gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And just follow what I underlined here, OK? Apostolic origin means they were written either by the apostles themselves or by others of the apostolic age. Apostles, Matthew, John, others, Mark, and Luke. Now, how do we know the four Gospels faithfully hand on what Jesus really did and taught? Well, because Article 19 of Dei Verbum says, Holy Mother Church has firmly... It's, uh, down. Page 50 is the, goes the, it was copied the other way, so you just have to flip it over, okay? Holy Mother Church has firmly and with absolute constancy maintained, continues to maintain that the four Gospels, whose historicity, meaning historical truth, okay, she unhesitatingly affirms, faithfully hand on what Jesus, the Son of God, while he lived among men, really did and taught for their eternal salvation. Well, is there proof for this in the Gospels? Yes. Now, what I quote here in the answer to 75 is the beginning of St. Luke's Gospel. This is how St. Luke begins his Gospel. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have handed them down to us, okay, what's St. Luke saying there? I received them from eyewitnesses. Okay. I have decided, he's writing to Theophilus, to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may re realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. 
So what is St. Luke doing here at the beginning of his gospel? He's giving a testament so we can have confidence and faith in what he writes. So you can be certain that the things I'm writing to you are the truth because I'm relying on the eyewitnesses who told me. Now, who are the eyewitnesses that informed Luke of the things that he wrote? Could have been the apostles themselves, like Matthew. And also, I put up here, in the margin there, the Blessed Virgin Mary. In St. Luke, we read about what we call the infancy narratives, how Mary conceived Jesus, the Annunciation, the angel coming, how Mary traveled with Joseph to Bethlehem, how they gave birth. Who would have known those things 35, 40 years later when the Gospel writers started writing? Who would have known about the Annunciation and the birth of Christ other than the Blessed Virgin Mary? She was an eyewitness to this. And um, as if you read down in the, my answer to 75, the footnotes, you know, always read the footnotes when you're reading a document. Because the footnotes tell you things. And the footnotes to the document, I don't have you, I, I'm not going to have you take it out today, but if you look at the footnotes okay, uh, for paragraph 19, uh, they contain citations from the Gospel of St. John, taken from Jesus' words at the Last Supper. And I quote them here. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, will, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I taught you. That's John 14, 26. Remind you of all that I taught you. So what is, what is the church teaching here? What is St. John teaching us here? That the Holy Spirit came on when? When did the Holy Spirit come? Pentecost, okay, to remind the apostles, refresh their memories of all that Jesus had told them, especially Matthew and John. So when they're writing their Gospels, they've got it up here, and they're going to write it down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus says, when he comes, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you in all the truth. So that includes the writing of the Gospels. So they pass on the truth to us about what Jesus did and said. Okay. Question 76 the Gospels sometimes contain different versions of Jesus' teaching. Does this raise a problem? Remember, in the little dialogue we read, you know, back and forth that uh, Eason and John, you were reading, okay? That's one of the objections that Sal made. Well, sometimes the Gospels mm -hmm. offer us different versions. Well, is this a problem? No. Article 19 of A. Virgo says, my answer here, the underlying part, the sacred authors in writing the four Gospels selected certain of the many elements which had been handed on, either orally or already in written form. Others, they synthesized or explained with the eye to the situation of the churches, that is, churches meant the dioceses, the areas um, that they were writing for, the people, all the while sustaining the form of preaching, but always in such a fashion they have told us the honest truth about Jesus. Whether they relied on their own memory or recollections or the testimony of those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses of the word, that's a quote from St. Luke, their purpose in writing was that we might know the truth. Okay. So, the church teaches first that in writing the respective gospels, the evangelists use both oral and written sources. Matthew and John rely principally on the oral preaching deeds of Jesus, which they were eyewitnesses to. Mark and Luke used what was handed on orally from the beginning by eyewitnesses. But also, remember there were these people called scribes at the time of Jesus? Remember, there's reference to the scribes and Pharisees. What did a scribe do? They wrote. It's incomprehensible to think that Jesus preached for three and a half years and no one was writing down anything. Wouldn't that seem bizarre? That here's the, the teacher of teachers, and God would have wanted things to be written down. Oh, that sounds like a good, a good thing. I'm going to write this down. Okay. So this explains how Matthew, Mark, and Luke, remember we call them the synoptic gospels? You can read some of the same lines of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, a theory is that they may have been relying on, uh, you know, things that were written down already, 
and they just inserted those in their Gospels. Okay? So, and in, in the paragraph, um, the bottom section of page 51, in writing the Gospels, the evangelists also made use of other eyewitnesses as well. For example, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Later on, I, go, I talk about Pope John Paul II. He, he talks about how St. Luke used the Blessed Virgin Mary as a source. Who would else have known about the Annunciation? No one would have known. Okay. The birth of Christ, who would have known that except the Blessed Virgin Mary? So they got it from her mouth, St. Luke did at least. Okay. Additionally, Article 19 of David Verbal teaches, the evangelists made use of what was already in written form. Think about the scribes I just talked about, okay? Scribes were, were writing things. And it seems very reasonable that God, in his providence, would have had people writing down some of the sayings of Jesus so that the gospel writers could collect them and write down the gospel for us. So some of the things already in written form, but unfinished, they weren't in gospel form yet. And here we see reference to the various stages in writing the gospel. First stage, the life and teaching of Jesus. First stage. Second, the oral preaching of the apostles. They went out preaching. And third, they wrote, they wrote the things down. And secondly, the four evangelists selected certain sayings and events of Jesus, as I've underlined there, with an eye to the situation of the churches. That is, the varying situations, needs, religious, cultural backgrounds of the people they were writing for. Remember, I, who did, for whom did St. Matthew write? Remember I said it the other day? St. Matthew was writing for the Jews. St. Matthew begins his genealogy of Jesus when? With Abraham. Because Abraham is the father of the Jewish faith. He wants to show the Jews, convince the Jews, that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. St. Luke is writing for Gentiles, not Jews. He begins the genealogy of Jesus, goes back to Adam, to show the universality of the gospel. Jesus came to save all peoples of all nations, okay? So, now we're going to go on. Thirdly, page 52, okay? Just turn it over, flip it, okay? While the precise words of Jesus as recorded in the gospels may vary slightly, they nonetheless contain the true substance of his teaching. So, we're not saying that, that um, the gospel writers put down the exact word for word, every article of speech that Jesus said. No, they got the substance of his, his teaching. Okay? Not the exact wording, necessarily. Sometimes they may have gotten the exact wording, but, but they got the substance of his teaching. And that's why they say, as I go on to say, they sustain the form of Christ's preaching, always telling us the honest truth about Jesus. Why is the church teaching this? And why am I going over this? Because we have to have faith in the Gospels, that they tell us the truth about Jesus, that someone didn't just make these things up about our Lord, because that's what modern biblical scholars tell us. I'm going to show you that in a few minutes, okay? And then footnote four, there's a footnote to that article, okay? A church document, Sancta Mater Ecclesia, Holy Mother Church, dealing with the historical truth of the Gospels. That was written before uh, Dei Verbum was written, 1964, it states in part, that's the bottom of that paragraph, the truth of the gospel narrative is not affected in the slightest by the fact the evangelists report the sayings of Jesus' doings uh, in a different order. They may use different words to express what he said, not keeping to the very letter, but always preserving their sense. Okay. So, um, why did Pope Paul VI deem it necessary to defend the historical truth of the Gospels. This was back in 1964, mind you, okay? Why did he have to have a document issued, a separate document, to defend the historical truth of the Gospels? Well, because, as he says here, and I quote, today, this is 1964, how many years are we guessing? This is 51 years later, right? Yeah, because my dad's 51. Okay. 51 years later, 64 plus 51 is 2015, right? Okay. So, um, today, many publications circulated far and wide, the truth of the events and sayings reported in the Gospels is being challenged 
Various biblical experts were challenging the truth of the events recorded, the sayings recorded in the Gospels. Okay? And a document by the Pope goes on to say, promoters of these theories led astray by rationalistic prejudices. Remember, rationalism, uh, it's, it's reason that is above faith. Okay? They refused to admit what? The supernatural order. That a personal God intervenes in the world by revelation. If you're a rationalist, you don't believe that God acted in the world. You don't believe that Jesus was God if you're a rationalist. That's what it comes down to. Jesus was just a good God. You don't believe in miracles, in prophecies. I got that underlined here. Okay. Others have the wrong notion of faith. Others and I'm on the top of page 53, practically deny a priori the historical value character of the documents of Revelation. They overestimate the creative power of the primitive Christian community. So what, what that means is they say the early Christians just made up these things about Jesus because they missed him. That he was walking on water, that he performed miracles. They just made things up to strengthen their faith. Well, um, as I go on to, to quote Sancte Mater Ecclesia, okay, it further says, biblical scholars make use of, have you ever heard of this? The historical critical method. Did Mrs. Pitman ever talk to you about this? Okay. Historical critical method means you're going to look, try to, try to look at the history of, of a document, and you're going to look at it critically. Okay. You're going to, like it's... Um, you would do for, for a secular writing, okay? Well, um, that method, if you're using a bad philosophy, like you're a rationalist, you're going to come up with bad theories, okay? And at the bottom, you see my arrow where I draw all the way to the bottom of page 53, okay? His Erasmus lecture, January 27, 1988, I was in my second year uh, of theology then, okay? Um, Foundations, Approaches of Biblical Exegesis, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. Anyone know who that is? Ever heard of him? Who, who is Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger? He became someone famous. Oh, that famous. That's, Pope John. That's Pope Benedict XVI. Okay? Yes, this was before he was Pope. He was, he was the head of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith under Pope John Paul II. He gave an address. Oh, that's right. Okay? He gave an address, and this is right at the bottom three lines. Ratzinger said that the problem with much modern scientific scripture study in its use or misuse of the historical critical method is a, a philosophical one. Scholars like Rudolf Bultmann and others applied a model of evolution to the analysis of biblical texts. The non-historicity or untruthfulness of the miracle stories was no question anymore. In fact, they assume that as a fact. These are not historical. They're not, they're not truthful. Okay. Do, you, do you recognize that name, Rudolf Bultmann? That was in the little dialogue that Sal and Chris were, okay, that's what, that's what was put in there. Rudolf Bultmann talked about, he was one of the demythologizers, okay? We've got a demon, get rid of all these myths in, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels, okay? Uh, Jesus walking on water, like he multiplied uh, a few loaves and fed thousands, okay? And the resurrection of the dead, all these things are myths. So they're made up. Well, this is what Cardinal Rotson was criticizing. And he goes on to say, okay, the real philosophical presupposition for the evolutionary, non-historical view of biblical texts lies in the philosoph philosophy of a guy named Immanuel Kant, which leads to denial of the supernatural intervention of God in human history. What might seem like a direct proclamation of the divine can only be a myth. It is with this basic conviction that Boltzmann, with the majority of modern Exegetes, that is, scripture scholars, read the Bible. Okay? And now, go to the bottom of 
that same page, okay? This is Ratzinger again, saying that the result of scientific exegesis, this is what I've underlined, is only to provoke perplexity and doubt among upon numerous points. Okay? If you're saying that, oh, if you're reading the, the Gospels, these are all myths, well, what does that cause a student who's listening to a professor say that? If I was going to teach you, oh, most of the stuff in the Gospels is just myths and made up stuff, and we don't know if, if Jesus really said these things, you're going to doubt the historical truth of the Gospels. That's what Cardinal Ratzinger was critiquing, okay? Causes perplexity and doubt, and causes people to adopt positions contrary to the faith of the church on matters such as the virginal conception of Jesus, his miracles, even his resurrection and divinity. Uh, see what I have written on the bottom there? Jesus seminar, okay? And oh, I put it in Perrin. You can write in there, his name is Norman Perrin, N-O-R-M-A-N, okay? Norman Perrin, N-O-R-M-A-N, because I'm gonna show you his book right now, but I'm gonna show you, I'll show you Perrin's book first, okay? Two of, two of Norman Perrin's books, when I went back to study, um, I, had, I had to go back to, to college for a year in order to enter a theology school because I didn't have enough philosophy when I was going through college the first time because I wasn't planning on being a priest. I was out working for four years as an attorney and then I entered the seminary. Okay? And at a Catholic, univers at a Catholic university, okay, and this was widely used at many Catholic universities and widely used in Protestant universities. Okay? New Testament by Norman Perrin and Dennis Dooling. Okay. Norman Perrin, Perrin was uh, a theology professor at University of Chicago. That's a secular institution, but very high brow. You know, you've got to be pretty smart to get into the University of Chicago. Okay. If, you, if you get into the U of C, you're, you, you've got a job anywhere you want. Okay. And this was written by Norman Perrin to the resurrection of Jesus. Now I'm going to read for you what college students were reading See, I had read this document, not the one in front of you, that's the one I wrote, okay? but I read the document, the Constitution on Divine Revelation, before I went back to college. Okay? So I knew what the church taught here. So we were reading this, and I challenged the professor, who was a nun, because I said, what... Professor Perrin is saying here contradicts the dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation. Okay, you know. And she had to admit that it did. Well, here's what, I'll just give you a couple snippets. This is what Norman Perrin read. Imagine if you're off to college and you're thinking you're, you're in, a, in a class with a professor who's supposed to know, you know the subject, okay? Here's what Norman Perrin says. This is page 398 of his New Testament book, okay? Earliest Christianity created a Jesus tradition, a tradition of sayings of Jesus and stories about him. Earliest Christianity's, Christianity also treated Jesus um, as the Hellenistic or Greek world treated its heroic figures. It developed legends increasingly depicting him as a man of miraculous knowledge and power. Legendary stories in the Gospels, such as the stilling of the storm, the walking on the water. What's he saying here? That the early Christians portrayed Jesus as, as Homer portrayed uh, uh, people in the, in the Iliad. Okay. Those were myths. But these are myths. Okay. Here he says, with the development of, uh, well, the Mark and hypothesis, that's, that Mark wrote his Gospel first, okay. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, here, what, what he says is um, the, the, the gospel of Mark, which he says was the first gospel, okay, which I disagree with, okay, um, is of no historical value. And the other gospels, Matthew and Luke, have no historical value. The gospel of John is even more intensely theologically motivated, also has no historical value value. Um, gee, if it has no historical value, let's just toss it out. Let's, you're believing myths. Okay. Now, what does St. Paul tell us 
if you deny that Jesus is risen from the dead, our faith is you know, you know what St. Paul says? He who denies that Jesus is risen from the dead, his faith is in vain. Okay. If Jesus is risen from the dead, I'm taking off my collar, I'm going to go out and have a good time. Eat, drink, and be merry. Okay. This is his book on the resurrection. Same guy, Norman Perrin. This is another book we read. Okay. And here's what Norman Perrin says. It's kind of sly, but it's very blatant, too. Okay. The story of 1776, you know, our revolution, comes to be told, retold, uh, as a basis for community life with people, American, American people as Americans. Okay? Um, it clearly has barriers between factual historicity, legendary accretion, and mythical interpretation. Okay? Yeah, you read about you know, George Washington chopping down a cherry tree with his axe. Okay? That, really happened. that may have been a myth. Okay? Uh, the hard-nosed historian will have all kinds of difficulties with the details of the stories of the American Revolution because they function as the means by which the American people regard themselves to be constituted as Americans. A mixture of history, legend, and myth. So you can continue this, this. The matter is no different with regard to the gospel narratives in general or the, or the resurrection narratives in the gospels in particular. The hard-nosed historian will determine that they are a mixture of history, legend, and myth. The resurrection is myth. Okay. Well, it gets worse than this. Um, in the 1980s and 1990s, um, there were seminars every year called the Jesus Seminar. And here's Time Magazine, 1995. Can we still believe in miracles? All these modern scripture exegetes got together, and um, and they met. I forget where they met. Okay, and they were they would go through the gospels every year and keep knocking out things that they said. Oh, this isn't really the truth. Okay, and here's an example of what you would read in Time Magazine on the basis of all the experts. Now, these are experts. See, so we trust in experts, don't we? Yeah. Well, so much for the experts. Okay. In recent years, the Jesus Seminar weighed Christ's actual words as reported in the Gospels and agreed that in most cases, he never said them. They considered the virgin birth, and 96% of the experts said it never happened. So Mary never conceived Jesus as a virgin. That's a myth. Dominic Crossan, who is the co-chair of the Jesus Seminar, um, argues this, he says, since the crucifixion was conducted by Roman soldiers, Jesus' body was most likely left on the cross or tossed into a shallow grave to be eaten by scavenger dogs, crows, or other wild beasts. This is blasphemy, you see. Now, Dominic Crossan, that's his picture. That's Dominic Crossan. Okay. This is him back in 1996. Okay. Now, Dominic Crossan taught at DePaul University for uh, 20 years. Corrupted the minds of students for all those years. I'll just tell you a little anecdote. Okay? When the movie The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie, came out, this was back about 10 years ago. I was in studies at Dayton. I happened to listen to the radio station in the morning. And the movie was about to come out, and they, they announced that John Dominic Crossan was going to be the guest to comment on the movie The Passion of the Christ. So I thought, ooh. I'd like to hear this because it was a call and show. So uh, actually, I had to drive a friend to the airport, I think, that morning. That morning, mm -hmm. I got back just with like five minutes left in the show. And, um, and I, I just heard that Dominic Crossman called the movie The Passion of the Christ blasphemous because uh, see, it really portrayed how Jesus suffered, but he doesn't believe. Jesus rose from the dead. He thinks Jesus' body was stone and scavenger dogs ate it. So they allowed a call in to question or to comment. Okay? Well, I thought, well, I'll call in and just see what happens. I didn't think I'd get on because uh, a lot of people were waiting. But I identified myself as Father Dwight Campbell. Well, guess where they put me to the top of the list? They said, 
And it kind of surprised me. They said, you're on in, in, in 20 seconds. I said, oh, OK. So when I got on, you know, I, I heard myself on the radio talk. And I said, uh, well, you know, I don't, we didn't know what to call you. Uh, is it Professor Crossan or Father Crossan? Because I know you were a priest and you left the priesthood. But I said, I don't think you're really qualified to give a good critique of uh, Mel Gibson's new movie because uh, you really can't call yourself a Christian because you deny that Jesus rose from the dead. You think his body was thrown to scavenger dogs. And if anything is blasphemy, that is blasphemy, Mr. Crossan. And well, just then, they ran out of time. And Dominic Crossan got angry. Wah! He started yelling as if to respond to me, and they cut him off at the divine intervention. So I undermined all that he said was good. Anyway, um, the, uh, this is the problem with modern scripture exegesis. And uh, I have something else I'll show you, too, because that was in 1995. Here, I don't know if, are you familiar with um, the great courses? Have you ever seen these? It's a, it's a service. They record college courses, university courses, and they sell them. I bought some of them. They're good. I, on all kinds of different subjects, you can get art and uh, architecture. You can get theology. And they were advertising, the great courses, um, um, an author named Bart Erdman. Okay. I wrote his name on the, on the bottom of your page there. Bart Erdman, didn't I? Yeah. OK. Here's Bart Erdman. And this is, this is a new book he published last year. Um, Who was the Jesus of history? Okay. And it says in here, he, Professor Erdman explains why it, it has proven so difficult to know about the Jesus of history. You learn that these books, the Gospels, are not written by dispassionate, as dispassionate histories, uh, that their authors do not claim to have been eyewitnesses to the events they narrate. Gee, St. Luke begins his Gospel saying that he got his information from the eyewitnesses. Okay? Uh, they are written decades later telling stories uh, that have been in circulation among the followers of Jesus. Okay? This is decades later, so things that were made up, basically. Okay? Um, anyway, there's Professor Erdman. He wrote another book where he says that Jesus was not God. That um, his latest book is that the early Christians created Jesus as a God that he wasn't God, he never claimed to be God, but they put words on his lips, saying, like, before Abraham was, I am. Okay. This is all blasphemy. And, uh, but this is what is being put out there for students. He's a college professor. Okay. What happens if some college student, not knowing things, goes and takes a course by Professor Crossan, or he's not at Paul anymore, anyway. Uh, or, or Professor Erdman, or one of these other fellows, okay, um, Norman Perrin, okay, they're going to have their faith in Christ undermined, okay. So, uh, this is an apologetics course. That's why I'm giving you this information, because if you go off and you hear this nonsense, challenge the professor. Say, no, you're wrong, okay. And there's no historical evidence that they have for saying these things. They claim to be experts. Oh, they know languages, they know Greek and, and Hebrew and everything, but they have no real historical basis for saying these things. But how do they do it? Okay? Look at page 55, because these last few minutes, I'm going to tell you how they can do this. How can someone, a professor, come <coughs> along 2,000 years later and say that the early Christians made up all these things about Jesus? They don't tell us the historical truth about him. They made him into a god when he wasn't. How can they say these things? This is how they do it. Okay. Look at page 55, number 78. Okay. Practically speaking, what means have been used by some modern-day biblical scholars, and this, modern -day, this has been going on for hundreds of years, okay, to challenge and or deny the historical truth of the words and actions of Jesus? Well, they have posited a theory that separates the historical event of Jesus' life from the writing of the gospel accounts. In so doing, they deny the apostolic origin of the Gospels. That is, that the Gospels were written by the evangelists, whose names they bear, either eyewitnesses, Matthew and John, or those who spoke of eyewitnesses. Okay. 
They, by use of the historical critical method, a theory of evolutionary development is substituted, holding that the four Gospels were not written by the, the apostles and others of the apostolic age, but rather by unknown authors. They wrote the Gospels some 40 to 70 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And in the footnote there, 14 on the bottom, this is commonly held by most Orthodox biblical scholars that the Apostle John authored his in 96, okay? No one argues with that, okay? Anyway, um, they were the result of the early Christian community reflecting on what Jesus meant to them in their current situation. By denying the apostolic origin of the Gospels, their writing, okay, the testimony of the eyewitnesses to the actions of Jesus, then it becomes easy to challenge, even deny the historical truth, the events of the Gospels. In my margin here, I say they separate the writing of the Gospels from Jesus' life. So they say that there were no eyewitnesses. They were writing the Gospels in the 80s, the 90s, and just making things up about Jesus. Well, um, that is not the truth. And um, anyway, um, let me see how much time do I have here. Um, Go for because I, I quote Dueling and Crossan in the next paragraphs here, okay. and I want to um, I want you to go to let me see page uh, <clears throat> page of the text. Let me see here. No, actually, um, I'd like you to go to um, page sixty-five. Okay. Or 64. Mm -hmm. When was the last time the church excommunicated somebody that was in the place? Oh, I don't know. Um, I'd, uh, I'd put them on the rack. <laughs> Did you hear about the rack yesterday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, um, if you, uh, where's my, okay. Actually, go to page 62, I'm sorry. I'm going forward a little bit. Page 62. Is there any historical evidence to support the church's teaching the Gospels were written by the apostles, others of apostolic men? Okay. Yes, Gospel of St. Matthew. We have early testimony from the fathers of the church St. Matthew wrote his the gospel that bears his name. Eusebius, he was he, he was in the um, I think the the third century. His ecclesiastical history quotes Papias, who was the bishop of Hierapolis, Asia Minor. He had been a disciple of John the Evangelist. Okay? So, boy, you, you have a pretty early link there. Okay, saying that Matthew wrote the oracles of the Lord, the sayings of the Lord. In Hebrew, why would Matthew have written in Hebrew? Because he was writing for the Jews. Okay, so we have a very early witness that it was written in Hebrew. And I say at the end of the second century, Saint Irenaeus, also familiar with the writings of Pius, wrote Matthew published his gospel among the Hebrews in their own tongue. Okay? Um, the dating, the traditional Catholic teaching based on testimony going back to the early 2nd century, holds that St. Matthew was the first to write his gospel. The original Aramaic version appeared after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And immediately afterward, a Greek edition appeared. So all we have is the Greek. We don't have the Hebrew that, that was originally written. Okay. So, um, however, we have... Like I said, while there's no good, solid evidence that there's no historical proof that the gospel writers were writing in the 80s and 90s, okay, they do this in order to undermine the historical truth of the gospels. Because if the gospel writers weren't eyewitnesses or spoke with eyewitnesses, then they can say they, they made them up. Okay? But they have no evidence for this. There's no historical evidence. It's all one expert quoting another. It's all theories, okay? But there is hard evidence physical evidence that the Gospels were written early. And I have a book to that effect. 
This is called Eyewitness to Jesus. And it's written by Karsten Teed and Matthew Decona. Karsten Teed is a proprologist, an expert in proprology. A papyrus is what the early writers were writing. May I have your attention? Will the following students please report to the development office at the end of the day? Jeremy Jin, Joseph Prosco, Cameron Kozak, and Tabitha Hudak. And also will the following students please report to the main office after the bell rings? Tia Melia, Matt Curry, Megan Matrigano, Sarah Christensen, Caitlin Costum, Drew Connolly, Grace Prosco, Monica Uribe, Ben Verhagen, Trinity Andrea, Christian Martinez, and Abby Smith. Thank you. What Karsten T. did, he came across a papyrus. It was called the Magdalen Papyrus because it was in the College of Magdalen, part of the Oxford University of Colleges. It was originally dated like in the 80s, but um, with his expertise, uh, you can tell, you can date papyri, papyri and the writing by the shape of the Greek letters because through the decades of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s of the first century, the character of the Greek letters changed how people were writing. Well, he examined the, the Magdalene papyrus and determined that it was written probably no later than the 60s and as early as the 50s. And this was just a copy of Matthew's Gospel. So that blows out of the water the theory that the Gospels were written in the 80s and 90s. They were eyewitnesses. Matthew was alive in the 50s or 60s. Okay. Naturally, um, well, we're not sure about that for sure, but um, we know that the, the, and the Magdalene Papyrus is not the only one. There are others also that they dated very early. Okay. Uh, the important thing is we know that this wasn't the original. The fragment of the Magdalene Papyrus was based upon an earlier document. Okay. But the fact that the Magdalene Papyrus and other, other papyri that had gospel writings on them can be dated to the 50s and 60s shows their truthfulness. This is hard scientific evidence. This isn't some theory that, oh, I'm going to you know, just say that the Gospels were written not by the eyewitnesses. But that's what most modern scholars say. What did they, how did they confront this information? They ignore it. They pretend it doesn't exist. You will never hear this from a, a, a scripture scholar who says that the Gospels were written until the 80s or 90s. Okay? Anyway, we have to tr trust in the historical truth of the Gospels. And we're not giving you helps you to do that. So if you go off to college or encounter someone who's been brainwashed by, by a professor that says, oh, we can't believe things in the, in the Gospels, there are myths about Jesus, say, absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, you can trust in the historical truth of the Gospel. Have a good weekend. Pray hard. Go to church.